Feel free to ask any and all questions. Today we'll be talking about theory and topicality. All right, let's do it. So theory and topicality are arguments that you're not gonna see in a normal Atlanta Urban Debate League tournament. So today we're going to be talking not just about the procedures for debate in terms of speech times, topics, et cetera, but we're gonna be talking about the rules for debate. And like anything else in debate, they are up for debate. So uh, lecture topics. Today we're going to cover theory. Theory is an argument that allows us to debate about what the rules for debate are. We'll go over the argument structure, we'll go over some examples, and talk about how to run theory and then how to answer theory. We're also going to talk about topicality, which is a more specific type of theory argument run on the negative, which argues that uh, the relationship between the affirmative and the resolution is illegitimate. We'll go over the structure, we'll go over some examples, and then we'll talk about how to run and answer the type of argument. So what is theory? So debate is a little bit unique in that it is an argumentative game. And we have some procedures and we have some rules for the game. And that distinction is super important. So procedures, we have things like speech times. We have the number of rounds of the tournament. We have the number of participants in a given team. Those are things that are immutable and cannot be changed. But debate uh, doesn't really have any argumentative rules. Uh, in the AUDL, you have evidence rules, you have uh, closed packet, you have certain types of research being allowed. In a GFCA or non-league affiliated tournament, you have open evidence and you have open argumentation, which means essentially if you can make an argument persuasive, you can make it. As long as you can persuade the judge, you're good to go. That means that what we don't really have a way to resolve what if I think a particular style of argument should be allowed and you think otherwise. Theory is the way that we debate that out. We make an argument about what the rules for debate ought to be, and then we debate about the benefits of a competing vision of debate. So debate is a game. There are procedures, speech times, et cetera, but not, real, not so much rules. Theory is how we determine what the rules of debate ought to be. So the structure uh, goes a little bit like this. We have, first off, we have an interpretation, and this is our vision of what debate should be like. This could be anything from the negative ought to disclose their arguments before the debate to um, the affirmative must specify their agent. And that interpretation is going to say, here's what I think debate should be like. Then we go over the violation, which says, here's how the other team has not met my vision or has violated the rule I have proposed. So if we're arguing for the negative must do X, the violation would be, well, they did the opposite of that. And then the standards are gonna be the impacts to your arguments. So normally in a disadvantage, we would say something like the impact is nuclear war, the impact is economic collapse, the impact is uh, climate change. But here, we're concerned with two primary things. We're concerned with how does your vision of debate promote fairness and how does your vision of debate promote education? So how do we talk about that? Well, ultimately we can talk about things like, does each side have the ability to argue? Do they have ground under your interpretation of debate? There's a debatability aspect. Is it possible for uh, the affirmative and the negative to debate under your interpretation. So if I have a rule that says that the affirmative can only make one argument or the negative can only have one off case position, then obviously it's not going to make as much sense from an education or fairness perspective because that would make it impossible for the other team to debate. And ultimately, if you are running theory, your goal is to tell the judge that the other team should lose as a result of whatever they have done. So we have the interpretation, what your vision for debate is, the violation, here's how the other team has not fulfilled their burden or met the rules. We have standards, things like ground, predictability, education, fairness. Those are your impacts, your reasons why your interpretation is good. And then we have an argument that as a result of this abuse, as a result of what the other team has done, the judge should reject, reject the team. Now, if we're answering theory, we have a very similar argument. We have a counterinterpretation, which is a competing vision of what we should have done. So let's say the negative reads a counterplan. The AF says interpretation, you're not allowed to read a counterplan. Violation, you read a counterplan. Standards, it's unfair because you get to uh, advocate multiple distinct things. You get to advocate the status quo and the counterplan. My counterinterpretation could be I get to read a counterplan. 
the standards would be things like benefits, my interpretation, things like it's real world. So talk about different ways to solve a problem. It's fair because it gives the negative better, more, better and more ways of answering the affirmative. And worst comes to worst, the person answering theory is going to say, we should reject the argument. You know, the other team says the punishment should fit the crime. They were super abusive. Reject the team. The team answering theory says, you know, we just want to reject the argument. If we did something bad, then maybe the counterpoint goes away. So again, interpretation, what our vision of debate is like. Violation, how they violated that vision. Standards, which are your impacts, unlike a normal disadvantage. These are going to be things related to fairness or education. And then the counterinterpretation, if I'm answering theory, is going to be, hey, I have another way of thinking about debate. So ultimately, uh, we want to do a couple of things in order to be prepared when we're running theory, because we want to prepare our interpretations and our counterinterpretations beforehand. So what's a checklist that we should think of? So before the tournament, we want to write out some blocks. And we want to do this with any arguments, but in particular for theory, because it's almost purely analytic, right? You're not researching evidence. You're not looking up the latest CNN article in order to figure out whether or not the negative should be able to read a counter plan. Writing things out gives you the ability to think through the argument and really think about what your interpretation would be. So for example, there's a big difference between interpretation, the negative shouldn't be able to read a counter plan and interpretation, the negative can't read 50 state fiat counter plans, right? They sound pretty similar, right? They both prohibit the negative from reading a type of advocacy, but one is way more specific. And as a result, your standards are going to be more specific to that argument as well. You also want to think about blocks for common arguments. And the reason this is important is if you're the affirmative and you're extending theory, odds are that you're doing it in the 1AR, right? You made a theory argument in the 2AC, the negative was abusive. And then we say, okay, um, we're going to extend this. And the 1AR is super time crunched and you don't have a ton of time to explain. So you want to write up things like an overview explaining what your interpretation is, reiterating your most important standards, and then answering different arguments that you think the other team would make. That way, when the 1AR is thinking about giving the 1AR, they don't have to say, oh, I need to write out all this stuff. Instead, they can focus on other arguments, adapting to the particularities, what happened in the block, etc. And then you need a final rebuttal overview. And this final rebuttal overview is going to assume that you're going to go for theory. Generally, we have two levels of the debate. We have theory, where we debate about debate, and then we have substance, where we debate about the plans or the affirmative advocacy. If we're talking about theory and asking the judge to reject the team, the final rebuttal, odds are our argument is that the debate has been so abusive, we cannot debate the substance. That means that it's good to have a final rebuttal overview where you say, here is what they have done. They made conditional arguments. They read a certain type of counter plan. And that will help us really describe to the judge what our interpretation is, what our impacts are, our standards, fairness and education, and why it is worth rejecting the team. So we all do all that before the tournament, right? We're prepared, we think about our arguments, and we think about how we would win the debate. Like, just like any argument, you want to debate for the 2AR, think about what are my best arguments on this theory argument, and then work backwards to the 1AR and backwards to the 2AC to make sure everything's there. Before the debate, theory is very, very judge sensitive. Some judges have very strong opinions about Things like conditionality and performative contradiction. We'll talk about what those are here in a second. Some judges really don't care. And some judges will just never vote on theory. So you need to look up your judge's paradigm or ask around or ask the judge beforehand to figure out what do they think about theory. The other thing you want to think about is what does the other team normally do? Are they well known for reading three or four different counter plans? Is the other team significantly better or worse than you? If the other team is significantly worse than you and you feel like you have a good shot in substance, then theory might not be the best option because it's so subjective and in the hands of the judge. You might want to stick to a substantive argument that you feel like you could win more handily. And then finally, what's your commitment level going to be? Is this a, something where the 1AR is going to quickly extend it to skew the 2NR? Or is this something where you feel like if you get in trouble, you have a really good shot 
going all in on theory in the one air. So you also want to be thinking about your arguments. At the end of the day, you need to prove to the judge that you have been, the other team has been abusive to the point where they should reject the team. You also want to think about what are my impacts, fairness, education. As long as you're talking about here how, here's how they've been unfair and uneducational, and here's why you should reject them, you're making a good theory argument. So now let's think about answering theory. So before the tournament, we want to do the same stuff, right? We want to write out our counter interpretations, and we also want to write out blocks for common arguments. One thing that you can really do if you're negative and you're answering affirmative theory is that you want to make two arguments for every one argument that they make. And the reason you want to do this is because theory arguments are almost entirely analytic, right? You're not reading large pieces of evidence. So if they say, well, you shouldn't get to read a counterplan, it's uneducational, you say, well, actually, one, it is educational because we test real world thinking skills. And then second, it's fair for whatever reason. And that makes it really hard for the 1AR to answer all of those arguments and also get to the substantive part of the debate. So we're writing out our counter interpretations. We're writing on our blocks. And ultimately, we want to be thinking, what are our negative strategies going into the tournament? If we hit a particular affirmative and our plan is to read three counter plans, then we probably should have a counter interpretation explaining why it's good to read three counter plans. If our thing is that we want to do all the affirmative advocacy except one specific part, or we want to read a particular type of counter plan, we want to have a theoretical defense as to why we're going to do that. Nothing is worse than reading a really solid argument, the other team makes a theory argument, and then you have nowhere to go. So before the debate, if you're negative, you wanna be asking, what can we get away with? If you're not cheating, you're not trying. So you wanna think about the judge. Is the judge gonna vote on theory? Do they like multiple conditional advocacies? Do they like certain types of arguments? Ask the judge beforehand or read the judge's paradigm. You also wanna think about the other team. What are they likely to do in terms of argument preferences? Have they won any debates on theory this year? Do they have a reputation for extending theory into the, into the 1AR? Is there a big skill disparity? Again, if you're way better than the other team, you might just be able to beat them on substance. So now let's talk about, so at the end of the day, to answer theory, you want to one, be prepared, make sure you have a counter interpretation that's thought out and a set of arguments to justify your actions. And you also want to be thinking about why is it necessary for the other team or why is it necessary for the judge to reject us as a team? Odds are you haven't destroyed the debate to the point where it is impossible for them to engage in substance. And as a result, um, rejecting the team is not a punishment that fits the crime. So let's talk about a common theory argument, uh, which is conditionality. The idea of conditionality is that the negative defends the status quo in a traditional debate, right? You have a disadvantage that says the affirmative passes a plan. The negative says we should do the status quo instead. We're arguing against change. And they defend the status quo. They say that there are negative consequences to the plan. But we can also prove that change is bad or that the plan is a bad idea in other ways, right? We can have a philosophical objection to the plan and say that instead we need to rethink the way that we've approached the issue. We'd say that, you know, that's a really good idea, but maybe there's an alternative solution that the federal government could do or that the states could do. Those other advocacies, those other ways of solving the problem, a critique or a counterplan, are conditional advocacies. And they're conditional because the negative isn't committing to always advocating the counterplan throughout the debate. The negative is not committing to always advocating the critique throughout the debate. Instead, they might say, you know, you proved that that state's counter plan just isn't the best idea, but we still think the AF causes more harm than good, so we'll win on the status quo. They could even read a critique and a counter plan that contradict each other, right? The critique could say that government reforms are bad, the counter plan could be a government reform. So conditionality is an argument that those conditional advocacies are bad. So the interpretation would be something like the conditional advocacy is bad, or the negative is only allowed to run one, two, three, four, insert number of advocacies. The violation would be obviously that the neg ran conditional advocacies. In 2AC theory, generally the violation is implied. So you would say conditionality is bad. They only get one world. 
standards, remember standards are impact, which ultimately link up to fairness or education. Time skew would be a common standard. The affirmative has to spend a ton of time on arguments that the negative doesn't have to extend into the block. Real world education, we never debate the substantive particularities of an issue because the neg just runs and hides. They spread you out in the 2AC and then they collapse down to whatever you undercover it means that we don't have good in-depth debates. So conditionality, the negative can defend the status quo to prove the AF is a bad idea, or they can defend other ways of solving the issue. Those other advocacies are conditional because the negative doesn't have to advocate them. The 2AC would commonly say that conditional advocacies are bad, and they skew the affirmative's time, and they undermine real-world education. Another example is an argument about performative contradiction, and we talked about that in a variety, or we talked about that earlier. The idea that the negative could run a critique that says that government reforms are bad, and they could also run a counter plan that says that government reforms are effective. So that is a performative contradiction because the negative has performed or spoken into existence contradicting arguments. So the argument that the affirmative would make against this would go a little bit something like this. Interpretation, there's no performative contradictions. Violation, again, probably assumed in 2AC theory, the negative contradicted itself. What are the standards? Well, first is debatability. So it's not debatable if the negative makes contradicting arguments because then the AF has to make contradicting arguments in the 2AC. In the world in which uh, the, the negative reads a counter plan that says that government is good and a critique that says government is bad, if the negative or if the affirmative makes no link arguments saying that, hey, we're not like super using the government, we don't use the state's power or anything like that, well, now they've hurt themselves in the counter plan that says that strong state action is necessary to solve a problem. So it's not possible to debate performative contradictions because the negative can concede affirmative arguments and the AF ends up debating itself. It's also not real world, right? If a politician contradicts himself, like with the current election, then you would say, hey, you're contradicting yourself. You don't have a clear stance on the issues. So that undermines education because we don't get to talk about uh, substantive policy concerns like the plan or the affirmative advocacy instead uh, the negative just throws out a ton of stuff that's all contradictory and then just solidifies in the 2 and R. So performative contradiction says that the negative contradicted itself, advocating two separate sides of an argument. Standards are things like debatability, which harms fairness, the idea that it's not real world, which harms education. So there are a ton of other examples of theory that I won't get into now. Uh, but they generally go down to X advocacy is bad or X behavior is bad. And X advocacy bad can be something like particular types of counterplans, states counterplans, consult counterplans, delay counterplans are bad for debate, they're uneducational, et cetera. They can also talk about particular type of critique alternatives, floating picks, where the uh, negative says that we will do the affirmative, but with a different mindset. Or utopian alts, the idea that we should just have utopian world peace or something like that. Those advocacies are harmful for debate. The other side of the coin is X behavior is bad. Disclosure theory. You should have disclosed before the debate your arguments before the debate. You didn't. Performed a contradiction, which we already talked about. You made arguments in a particular way that was bad. Sandbagging bad. And what I mean by sandbagging is you save your best arguments for the block. So, for example, you read part of a disadvantage in the 1 and C, and then it becomes a whole new argument in the 2 and C or 1 and R. That's a, what we would call sandbagging. A great example of this is 2 and C counterplans or 2 and C advocacies, where the negative says, oh, you brought up a really good point, so we're going to have an advocacy in order to solve that. It's brand new. It's an additional conditional world. It's unfair. So the TLDR on theory, if you've gotten this far, is theory says that there's a particular rule that debate should have. The other team has violated this rule. The rule is edu promotes education and fairness. As a result, we should reject the other team for being uneducational and unfair. But on the other side of things, um, if we're answering theory, we say, you know, it's always better to debate the substance of an issue than to debate about debate. You should reject the argument if you want to, or if it was truly abusive. 
there's no reason why you should reject the team. And you can also just straight up say that rule is a bad rule, right? We should have conditional advocacies. We should have counter plans, et cetera. So now let's talk about topicality. So topicality is an argument about the relationship between the plan and the resolution. It's a particular type of theory argument that the negative reads. So if you do public forum or Lincoln Douglas debate, you often see resolutions like on balance and then a particular thing. Or in Lincoln Douglas, it would be like civil disobedience is morally justified. And the affirmative role in those particular debates is to say that generally speaking, the resolution is true or false. That's a truth testing idea. But in policy debate, it's really hard if you look at the current resolution to imagine truth testing, right? It's just too big. There's too many different specifics. If we think about the United States federal government should enact substantial criminal justice reform in the United States in one or more of the following forensic science, policing, sentencing, that's so much. It's such a big resolution. So the role of the affirmative then is not to prove the entire resolution true, but to say that, hey, here is an example that I think is good. And then we debate about that example, a plan, whether or not it's good or bad. Topic Howdy says there's not a relationship between the plan or example that the affirmative has chosen and the broader resolution. As a result, the affirmative has not fulfilled its basic role of proving the resolution true or supporting the resolution. So the negative says the resolution is false, the affirmative says the resolution is true, and we debate about whether or not the example chosen by the affirmative is representative of the resolution. And for topicality, the argument's going to be very, very similar, right? You're going to have an interpretation. Oftentimes, these are um, definitions of particular words in the resolution. So we might have a debate about what policing is. We might have a debate about what enact means. Can a court enact a decision, or is that only something Congress can do? What is criminal justice reform? Is the idea of something like subsidies for urban business, is that criminal justice reform because it helps keep people out of prison? Right, we can come up with a lot of ideas that are related to the resolution, but aren't quite there. So the violation is also generally going to be an argument about what the plan does. So it might be something like the court can't enact legislation, or it might be something like the affirmative is not a substantial reduction in something. And then you have standards. And generally speaking, the negative is going to be arguing if they're running topicality that it was impossible to debate the affirmative, right? They're such a small F that they can't, the negative doesn't have ground or that it's uneducational to debate about whether, whatever the AF has talked about. Generally speaking, as affirmatives get more and more specific, there's less and less negative ground and negatives resort more and more to topicality. Obviously the verdict is reject the team, uh, which makes sense given that if the plan is illegitimate, then the AF doesn't really have much, right? They, they don't have an advocacy. If we're answering topicality, we're going to have a counterinterpretation, just like we normally do. Counterinterpretation, uh, courts can enact legislation or can enact a decision. Um, we would have our violation of how um, the other team is not meeting our particular goal, or we would have an argument about how our counterinterpretation is better for debate. Then we would have standards as our impacts, fairness, and education. And the verdict of what this rule means is that the judge default to reasonability. Reasonability says that the only reason why the relationship between the plan and the resolution matters is because it gives the negative ground to prepare. As long as the affirmative is in the ballpark, then it's always better to debate the substance of the affirmative than it is to debate about random esoteric definitions. It doesn't really matter whether substantial means a 25% or a 45% reduction, so long as the other team was able to debate. Otherwise, we just get trapped in endless cycles of topicality debates and we never get to the substantive issues. So if we're running topicality on the negative, what do we want to do? Here, we do need to do a little bit of research. Generally speaking, before the tournament or before the year starts, because the NSDA releases its high school resolution very early, you want a running definition of every term in the resolution. And you want different definitions so that you can make different types of arguments. So if an act only means legislation, that's a really good word for you in the current year because any court's affirmative is not topical. But you also probably want a definition that says an act can mean just any type of government policy because that means that you can run your court's affirmative or whatever. 
you also want to target before the tournament specific affirmatives that you think you don't have much against. Odds are when you're scouting out a tournament, which you should always do, look up what other teams have run on the high school wiki, you'll see, hey, I don't know what the heck this is. This is the affirmative funds paint classes in a particular prison. I have nothing to say against that. Let me prep a topicality argument to say that this is not topical. And you also want to be running out specific shells and specific blocks. So generally, with theory, you have arguments like conditionality bad, you have arguments like performed contradictions bad, and those will not really change year to year. Topicality, you'll have different topicality arguments year to year, and you need to prep them out. So T substantial, substantial is a 20% reduction or something like that. You might have criminal justice reform only relates to reform that targets specific criminal penalties something like that, and you'll write out your shells and you'll write out your blocks. Before the debate, you want to think, is topicality a strategic option for me? And we think about this in two ways. First is topicality an option for me in terms of getting them to concede that they are a particular way the plan operates. So maybe the plan is written in a really unclear way, or maybe it's really small f, but if you read T substantial and they say, actually, we're a super substantial change, then on your other arguments, you can go up and say, hey, that's a pretty big change. On T substantial, they said that they were a 40% reduction. They have to link to this disadvantage. Or you can think about topicality in terms of, will this win me the debate? You want to think about the other team. Do they read a really weird affirmative that's super small? You want to think about the judge. Um, how, what do they think about the, the topic? People will often run their paradigms. I think X affirmative is topical. I think X affirmative is not topical. Think about what types of affirmatives has the other teams or has the judge has the judge's teams read. So if a judge is affiliated with a particular school and that school reads really small affirmatives, then you might be thinking, huh, this topicality argument probably isn't going to be super persuasive. You also want to think about block setup. Topicality can be extended in two minutes, or it can be extended for the entirety of the 1 and R. So is this something the 2 and C is going to extend to skew the 1 AR? Or is this something that we're going for, and we really want to make sure that it's covered substantively in the block? So before the tournament, you want to do research so that we have definitions of particular words. We want to target specific affirmatives that we don't think we have stuff to answer. And then we want to write out shells and blocks explaining why our interpretations are good for debate. And before the debate, we want to think about is theory an option for us? So answering topicality, what does that look like? Well, before the tournament, it's always a balancing act because on the affirmative, you get to decide what your AF is, right? So you can decide, I'm gonna run a big stick core of the topic affirmative that everyone else is running and I will definitely be topical. Or you can say, you know, I'm gonna read a smaller affirmative, so I have to do, I have to worry about it a little bit less, but I'm gonna be really good at debating topicality. So you have to choose before the year when you're doing research, just how much you wanna deal with topicality as a problem. Because if you're reading a super small affirmative and teams here have nothing when they hit you, you are gonna hear a lot of topicality arguments. Why? Because they don't have anything else. You also want to write out a counterinterpretation. So on the affirmative, you want to be proactive. You want to think about how, what are ways in which I am topical. And you want to take the terms of art in the resolution, things like criminal justice reform this year, it acts substantial forensic science, policing, stuff like that, and have a proactive reason why you meet that particular interpretation. So let's say you only fund prison reform in the Southeast. But the other team says in means throughout the United States. Well, you probably wanna have a counter interpretation that says in just means within. You also wanna have two AC and one AR blocks. Debate for the two AR. What are the best reasons why you're topical? Move those back into the one AR to make sure they get extended, put them into the two AC block. And then before the round, think defensively. Does the other team have a history of going for topicality? 
uh, does the judge think a particular way about your affirmative? And if you have multiple affirmatives, maybe this even says, hey, in front of this judge, we're not going to read that kind of smaller, little less legitimate affirmative. And you have affirmative choice at the end of the day. You get to decide how much topicality is an issue for you. So choose wisely. What are some examples? So an example would be topicality substantial, which we've already talked about. And the purpose is to get negative ground. So almost every resolution includes the word substantial reform or substantially reduce or substantially increase. Otherwise, the affirmative could say, well, we're going to give one less dollar to the police, and that's my reform. And the impact, which is almost impossible to argue against, is that Officer Bob can't go to the vending machine. And that's very sad for Officer Bob, but it doesn't mean that the negative has ground. So the interpretation is generally going to be something like substantial equals X percent. The violation is almost always going to be the affirmative is too small reduction. And the standards are almost always going to be debatability. The negative doesn't have any grounds to research the minor change made by the affirmative. Can't access core generic arguments like federalism disadvantages, et cetera. It's also not real world because generally we don't debate those super specific, really tiny changes. Those get done by things like an administrative order, et cetera. So T substantial tests whether or not there's sufficient negative ground, uh, whether or not the affirmative is a sufficiently substantial change. And then finally, we have T enact. And generally, I put an act here because it's in this year's resolution, but you can almost always find a definition of reduction, increase, uh, substantially reform, and whatever the action verb in the resolution is, there's almost always going to be topicality debates about what that means. So this year, let's say that the negative says T and act means legislation. And the purpose generally is going to be counterplan competition. The affirmative has to go through Congress. We will have the Ninth Circuit District Court decide a particular thing. We'll have um, an administrative order be issued by the head of the Bureau of Prisons. Or it could also be the AF has chosen to do those things, right? The affirmative has a particular sub-administrator of a particular department issue an agency ruling. And it's really hard to make arguments about why that's bad because it just gets lost in the bureaucracy. So the interpretation would be a definition that in act equals legislation. A violation would be that the plan uses the courts or uses an administrative agency or is an executive order. And the standards again are gonna be things like debatability. There's no way to predict the affirmative. There's no way to have negative ground. And like I just said, negative ground ability to do research. And generally speaking, topicality, unlike theory, is going to be a little bit more evidence reliant. So the types of evidence that we might see in a substantial and activate is we might look at different court decisions uh, and say, what if they thought something substantial was? We might look at topic specific types of evidence. When discussing criminal justice reform, what do scholars think is substantial? If you have specific arguments about your affirmative using the language of the resolution, then you're probably really good. But on the other hand, if you're like, well, we're going to fund painting classes in a particular prison, you probably don't have that same level of evidence substantiating your claim. Oftentimes, judges let the evidence decide what is topical and what isn't. It's the most real world way to decide how to discuss the issue. So, having good researched, well-evidenced arguments about what the affirmative should and should not be is going to be really helpful for you. So the TLDR at the end of the day, theory says, here's a rule about debate. Here's why it's a good idea. If you don't follow the rule, then you should lose. Topicality says, here's what the, affirm the resolution means. Here's how the AF is an example of the resolution. Here's why my interpretation of the resolution is a good idea. All right, thanks for listening. And I'll turn it over to Q&A.